Thank you uh, once again, Jose, for the uh, introduction. As I said yesterday, if at any point I'm speaking too fast or I'm not clear enough, um, not only will Anthony start you know, waving table tennis bats, but you should uh, do so uh, as well. Yesterday, what I was talking about was very much translation in an absolutely contemporary moment, 21st century, with uh, immigration. What I'm going to do now is we're going to go back a few centuries in, in, in time to another particular interest of, of mine, which is translation uh, history. And I want to look at a point in 16th century um, British history, which seems to me to be absolutely crucial as a founding moment uh, for a lot of the concerns that are still absolutely contemporary and with us today. One of the things that Stuart Hall, the English cultural um, theoretician, cultural studies theoretician often says, is that when we talk about globalization, we should not uh, fall victim to the illusion that somehow the notion of uh, internationalization, of foreign expansion or whatever, is something that happened uh, yesterday or five years ago or ten years ago. In other words, the world as a place has been around for a very, very long time. And I want to look at the specific implications of that at a particular moment in uh, translation uh, history. So what I'm going to be uh, looking at is some of the plays of uh, Shakespeare. I'm not going to be looking at the translation of uh, Shakespeare, but uh, in De La Bastille, very eminent scholar. I'm going to be looking at some of the ways in which translation is represented in Shakespeare's plays. The way of thinking about translation, at the moment when a nation state gets formed, but a particular kind of nation state that's going to uh, embrace uh, empire. So what I'm going to be looking at uh, in this uh, lecture are questions of language, questions of power, questions of representation, the notion of metamorphosis and transformation, and the idea of insight and uh, control. So the primary framework then for the discussion of these issues um, will be the experiences of both translation and interpreting in late uh, 16th century, early 17th century uh, Britain and uh, Ireland. So what I'm going to do, yesterday I told you uh, of my obsession with these kind of Celtic triads, doing everything in triplets, uh, and today won't be any exception. Uh, I want to first of all start off with uh, looking at some of the classical and Renaissance theories of uh, eloquence because they're absolutely crucial in thinking about power and translation in that uh, period. Um, secondly, I want to look at the relationship between translation and uh, English uh, nationalism and uh, subsequently imperialism as we see it represented in some of Shakespeare's uh, plays. And finally, I want to look at the notion of the translatability of Shakespeare himself as a way of looking at the globalization of English, of the, uh, the English uh, language. One of the main concerns of Renaissance humanism was this notion of civility. In other words, what kinds of things would you need to study? What kinds of things would you need to practice in, in order to acquire civility, civility being the ability to participate in a civilized uh, society? What were the attitudes, what were the beliefs, what were the values, what was the behavior that would allow one to become a full member of a civilized uh, politics? And one of the crucial elements of civility was the notion of eloquence. That uh, eloquence was something that would characterize uh, someone who was fully in possession of uh, civility. And central to the Renaissance view of the world was that language through eloquence was transformative. That language through eloquence was something that could change uh, the world around you, could change your social, political, and uh, economic uh, circumstances. The first uh, quotation, um, which I want to show you here on the uh, overhead uh, projector, is um, taken from 
a work that enjoyed great success in the uh, early 15th uh, century. It was uh, a text by Pier Paolo uh, Vergerio, uh, with character and studies befitting a freeborn uh, youth. Um, what Vergerio says is that there are three things that one should study. There is philosophy, um, there is uh, history, and there is others. So what are the different options then uh, of these different uh, areas? Through philosophy we can acquire great views, which is of first importance in everything. Through elements we can speak with weight and polish, which is the one skill, and this is the part of the quotation I want to, to uh, draw your attention to, which is the one skill that most effectively wins over the minds of the, uh, the masses. Vergerio was, in saying this, drawing on uh, a very ancient tradition of thinking about the notion of uh, eloquence. Uh, in the next uh, transparency, we can see what um, Cicero has to say about uh, Eloquence. What's interesting here is that um, it's what he used to say about figurative language and what he calls proper words. But let me just. The supreme orator then is one whose speech instructs, delights, and moves the minds of his audience. So you see where Vergerio is getting um, this uh, idea from in his 15th century text. For as eloquence consists of language and thought, we must manage by keeping our diction faultless and pure, that is in good Latin, to achieve a choice of words both proper and figurative. Of proper words, we should choose the most elegant, and in the case of figurative language, we should be modest in our use of metaphors and careful to avoid far-fetched comparisons. And there's a lot we can say, I think, later in our discussions about the relationship, the kind of dual position of figurative language as both something that is the ultimate flower of language, but also something that's deeply uh, dangerous and unsettling for, uh, for language. The last um, transparency I'd like to show in, in establishing this kind of link between the Renaissance concern with uh, eloquence and the classical uh, tradition is what Quintilian has to say in linking eloquence to uh, translation. In his Institutio uh, on Italia, he says that the purpose in translating from Greek is for the Greek authors excel in copiousness of matter and have introduced a vast deal of art into the study of eloquence. And in translating them, we may use the very best words, for all that we use may be our own. As to uh, verbal figures by which language is principally ornamented, we may be under the necessity of inventing a great number and variety of them because the Roman tongue differs greatly from that of the, the, the Greeks. Um, so what he is uh, suggesting there is that one of the most powerful ways of sustaining eloquence is through translation. One of the most powerful functions of eloquence uh, as a product of translation is the ability to have influence, is the ability to have effect, is that link to uh, power, which is re-expressed with full authority and clarity in the Renaissance uh, period. Because what we find is a tradition going from antiquity to Renaissance humanism, which is arguing that one of the most powerful figures, if you like, is the one who is eloquent, the one who uh, masters crowds, if you like, through the use of uh, language. If we look at the 16th century, when uh, Shakespeare is writing his, uh, his plays, or he starts writing his plays, um, what is happening in the kind of the larger uh, political uh, scene? What's happening in the larger political scene is something that is reflected in Shakespeare's history plays. If we compare, for example, Richard II uh, to uh, Henry IV, part one and two, and Henry V, we find that these plays are looking at and describing uh, very different uh, worlds. 
And in this context, I just wanted to quote uh, a French thinker, a man called Jean-Marc uh, Chadelat, who says, um, if I may quote him in French, uh, for us, I think it might be my sort of translation, « À l'espace clos et défensif des sociétés passéistes, correspond par une inversion analogue, l'ouverture d'un espace rendu extensible par la nature expansionniste de la puissance d'action sur euh, soi-même. » To the closed and defensive spaces of societies concerned with the past correspond by a similar inversion the opening of a space made expandable by the expansionist nature of power acting on itself. Um, in other words, and this is where you sometimes have to uh, translate uh, theoretical uh, language, what Shadla is, is arguing is that the world that you find in the plays of Richard the, 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 the II, the pre-Renaissance world, is a world that is structured by a theological order where people have, if you like, a heteronymous, a, a dependent relationship to a notion of monarchy and a theocentric uh, world. This uh, changes and this is changing in, in Shakespeare's plays in the 16th century, with the emergence of an autonomous uh, space where what you basically, uh, what happens or what you make in that space is what you as an autonomous individual make of it. Which means, of course, that you can continually move outwards. That there's a kind of expansionist, because, you know, as people act and then they act on their acts and act on their further acts, it's pushing the world uh, uh, outwards. What's interesting is that this kind of expansion, which is permitted by an autonomous notion of self, is something that's going to have two parallels. It's going to have a spatial parallel and it's going to have a linguistic parallel. The spatial parallel will be the expansion of England beyond its uh, borders. The linguistic uh, parallel is the expansion of the English language uh, itself. Um, and here I want to quote from a man called uh, Fines uh, Morrison, who was an extremely important um, propagandist for the uh, English The English calls in, uh, in Ireland. Basically, what happens from the 1540s onwards is that the English crown sets about the reconquest of uh, Ireland, but in a much more systematic and militarily aggressive fashion than had previously been the, the case. Fines Morrison, during the English campaigns in Ireland, is producing if you like, propaganda for the, uh, the English uh, crown. But interestingly, he's also someone who is extremely active in the defense of English as a vernacular uh, language. And what does he say? As is happening in so many countries, it happens in Italy, it happens in uh, France, he's defending the vernacular. And he says, they are confuted who traduce the English tongue to be like a beggar's patched cloak which they should rather compare to a posy of sweetest flowers, because by the said means it had been in late ages excellently refined and made perfectly perfect for ready and brief delivery, both in prose and uh, verse. A contemporary of uh, Fines Morrison, again, who is involved in the military campaigns in Ireland, so this is the territorial uh, expansion, which will then uh, move uh, even further to the, uh, the west. A, another contemporary of Fines Morrison, deeply involved in the military campaigns, but also deeply involved in the defense of the English uh, language, is a man called uh, Humphrey Gilbert. Uh, Humphrey Gilbert produced a book in um, 1580 called Queen Elizabeth's uh, Academy. What he argued was that London needed an Oxford and it needed a Cambridge. It needed its own uh, university. But the crucial thing is that the central items of the, the curriculum 
in this new university to be called Queen Elizabeth's Academy were two things. One, the dominant language would be the vernacular language, it would be English. And the second thing that the Academy would do is it would concentrate almost exclusively on oratorical training, on training eloquent orators, in producing people who would be the embodiment of Renaissance uh, civility. But he also said that one of the things that was hung of some good work as a legitimate academic activity, whereas in that period, uh, for Humphrey Gilbert at any rate, it was more uh, important. Why did um, Humphrey Gilbert argue for translation? His argument was simple. It was Fines Morrison's argument as well. The more eloquent the English language, the more better suited it was to be the language of empire. If eloquence was power, if the sign of Renaissance civility is uh, eloquence, if we have an autonomous political structure, well then we are getting uh, uh, expansion. But in order to, to be the legitimate inheritors of the right to expand, we must prove that we are capable of using and expressing power, and this is through uh, eloquence. Um, but how are we going to achieve that eloquence in the English uh, language? One of the ways in which uh, the English language is going to achieve this is uh, through uh, translation. It's very striking, for example, that the leading uh, colonial military leaders uh, and adventurers of the, uh, the Elizabethan period, people like Brisket, people like Fenton, uh, people like Goog, people like Harrington, um, all of these were not only military leaders and political advisors, but they were also among the leading translators of their uh, age. In fact, some of them were involved, if you like, uh, continuously in translation work as they were engaged in their uh, military uh, campaigns. So there's a sense, as Patricia that are sort of being pushed uh, back, that the uh, language itself, its borders are being pushed back to this expansionary movement through the agency of uh, translation. I want to look at this more specifically with uh, respect to two languages from the uh, period, uh, languages in, in very different political uh, circumstances, uh, not to be staged very uh, often now. Um, it's a play that's not talked about, I think, as much as it could be. And this is uh, Henry the uh, Sixth, Part uh, Two. Because it's a play that offers fascinating insights, it seems to me, into the kinds of dilemmas that's faced by England in this expansionary uh, moment. But it's a kind of concern that repeats itself again and again and again uh, through history. And in fact, it's acting. Uh, itself out before our very eyes uh, present in uh, Iraq. Um, I want to uh, begin with um, one of the events in the play is there's a revolt by uh, a rebel uh, leader, a man called uh, Jack uh, Cade. And uh, one of the other characters called Lord uh, Say um, offers his services as a kind of an honest broker in negotiating between Jack Cade and the, uh, and the king. Um, what's interesting is, as we'll see in this uh, extract, is that Cade's attitude to Lord Say is very much dictated by Say's role in a kind of translation or language uh, space. Um, so Cade is talking to his, uh, his cronies, and he says, um, but there's also a number of the king's representatives uh, there, including uh, Stafford. And he says, fellow kings, I tell you that Lord Say have gelded the Commonwealth and made it uh, a eunuch. And more than that, he can speak French, and therefore he is a traitor. Stafford, oh, gross and miserable ignorance. I think of poor John Kerry uh, not wishing to speak French during his uh, election uh, campaign to the, the president. Cade says, nay, answer if you can. The Frenchmen are our enemies. Go to them. I ask you but this. Can he that speaks with the tongue of an enemy be a good counselor? So 
What Cade is uh, expressing there is a kind of a fear that's haunting uh, the, the, the late uh, 16th century. Edmund Spencer, author of The uh, Fairy Queen, um, in his text, A View of the Present State of uh, Ireland, puts forward an, an argument that's very similar to that of Shakespeare's uh, Jack uh, Cade, where at one point Spencer says, we must stop these people uh, speaking uh, Irish because he says, why? The speech being Irish, the heart must needs be uh, Irish. For out of the abundance of the heart, the tongue speaketh. Right? In other words, it's kind of a strong version of linguistic relativism, uh, but it's rel linguistic relativism that has political consequences. If these people are speaking Irish, uh, then by definition, they must be disloyal and uh, subversive. Um, what's interesting, however, is Say is eventually, uh, he's captured by the, uh, the rebels. And um, he's brought before uh, Jack uh, Cade. And Cade, you know, charges them once again, saying, you've, spoke, you've spoken with the French, the French are our enemies, so therefore uh, you must be our, our uh, enemy. And what uh, Lord Say says in his defence, this English to further the English of Jack Cade uh, himself. Because one of the things that we find out from uh, uh, York in the, uh, the play is Jack Cade himself has been involved in translation uh, activity. This is York talking about Cade. He says, in Ireland, I've seen this stubborn Cade oppose himself against a troop of Cairns. Cairns were the sort of, uh, Irish Gaelic uh, soldiers. Uh, and fought so long to that his thighs with darts were almost like a sharp quill. Firstly, that he has been uh, in the military uh, campaign. But then we learn something very interesting about a Jack Cade is that full often, like a shag-haired, crafty kern, hath he conversed with the uh, enemy, and undiscovered come to me again, and given me notice of their villainies. So in other words, Jack Cade, who has condemned Lord Say for his translation activities, as proof of his complicity with the enemy, has himself been engaged in uh, translation uh, activity in Ireland, in his conversations, in his, his dialogue with the Irish, uh, so pretending to be one of them, pretending to talk to them, and then passing on the, uh, the information to his um, English uh, masters. The first thing to say about that is you uh, wonder about Jack Cade's ability to perform this task because in order to but he ends up just a number of things to say about Cade before um, I, I leave him and move on to uh, another uh, part of this area is one of the things that he does is he puns relentlessly this, it, um, it's um, Dirk is here he'll be uh, able to say more about this but um, he practices a kind of double language within uh, the English language itself. He becomes a kind of linguistic double agent, who both interlingually but also intralingually. Uh, uh, and it seems to me that in the area of translation and uh, humor, um, there are very interesting consequences when we think about uh, this kind of linguistic doubling as a kind of intralingual uh, translation uh, practice. Uh, secondly, what's interesting here is we get the, uh, the garment uh, metaphor, is that he is uh, undiscovered. Uh, In other words, he dresses like uh, the uh, native uh, Irish. Um, and, of course, this is the, the notion of dress, as Theo Hermans has pointed out, is a central part of Renaissance discourse on uh, translation. Finally, when Lord Say is um, being charged by Jack Cade and his rebels and before he loses his, his head. Um, there's a list of charges that are drawn up uh, against him. What's he accused of? He's accused of uh, consorting with the enemy because he translates from French. 
He promotes the printing press. Thou hast caused printing to be used. Um, he exhibits a high degree of language awareness. Jack Cade says, Thou hast men about thee that usually talk of a noun and a verb and such abominable words as no Christian can endure to hear. Uh, what's interesting, of course, is that it's the printing press um, that's crucial to the dissemination of translation in the English-speaking world, particularly through uh, Bible uh, translation. But it's also the fact, as we saw earlier, that it's our translators, our military uh, generals, uh, who are also people who are contributing to linguistic self-awareness in uh, England of the, uh, of the time. And what's interesting is the kind of anxieties around expansion and vulnerability, which are uh, still very much with us, I think this came up in one of our conversations yesterday, um, are absolutely uh, characteristic of the, uh, the period. And I wanted to give you a quote from a friend of the English uh, metaphysical poet John Donne, a man called uh, Sir Henry uh, Wotton, um, who at one stage was the uh, English ambassador to Venice when the English crown felt that uh, the Venetians might embrace the reformed uh, religion. Um, but Wotton was also involved with um, the Earl of uh, Essex in his negotiations with uh, Hugh O'Neill, the leader of the uh, Gaelic uh, Irish, the last important, if you like, rising uh, against the, uh, the invasion. What does he say? Uh, this is Sir Henry Wotton. He's writing to his friend John Donne, and he says, whatsoever we have done or mean to do, we know what will become of it when it comes among our worst enemies, which are interpreters. I would, there were more O'Neills and Maguires and O'Donnells and McMahons and fewer of them. Wotton's worst enemy, he feels, are the translators, the interpreters. Um, one of the things that, um, and I hope uh, I'm going to be talking about this uh, tomorrow in sociologies of, of translation. But the American sociologist Bruce Anderson, in an essay many years ago, 1976, writing about the interpreter, he says that his position in the middle has the advantage of power inherent in all positions which control scarce resources, end of quote. So proximity is something that is both desirable um, you, know, you want to get closer to, to the, 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 the other for information, to co-opt things from their culture into your culture, to know more about them, uh, the better sometimes with which to, to, to conquer uh, the place. But at the same time, you dread that, 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 that proximity. And, and translation is caught between the... It's fed by the desire for proximity, but it's haunted by the dread of uh, proximity. And this is... Uh, stated quite succinctly by William Jones in his uh, Grammar of the Persian Language from 1771, where he says, it was found highly dangerous to employ the natives as interpreters upon whose fidelity uh, we could not uh, depend. In other words, the kind of dilemma that's faced by empire is one that I've talked about in terms of the kind of the, the politics of interpreting is the dilemma between autonomous forms of uh, interpreting and heteronomous forms of interpreting. In other words, autonomous forms is a form whereby you train people from your own uh, country uh, in the foreign uh, language and then you, uh, send them to the, the foreign country and they act as your uh, translator uh, interpreters. The uh, heteronomous Form is you rely on somebody who's a native of that country to learn the imperial uh, language and therefore to act as the, uh, the, the agent. There's a very beautiful illustration of the tension between autonomous and heteronomous forms of interpreting. In a letter that was um, sent on the 1st of May 1500 by uh, a Portuguese officer called Pedro uh, Vaz de Caminha. And in his letter, he's giving an account of a 
Portuguese admirable, admiral, I always get this one wrong, admirable. Um, you can delete that from the tape. <laughs> um, but this Portuguese uh, admiral who is asking his officers whether they should in fact take two Tupi uh, Indians uh, back with them to uh, Lisbon uh, in order to uh, teach them uh, Portuguese. Um, what's interesting, uh, and of course these will, the Tupis will be taken by, by force, um, and what's interesting is that a majority of the Portuguese officers um, said the following. It was not necessary to take men by force, since those taken anywhere by force usually say of everything they are asked about it that they have it in their country. If we left two of the exiles there, they would give better, very much better information than those men if we took them, for nobody can understand them nor would it be a speedy matter for them to learn to speak well enough to be able to tell us nearly so much about the country as the exiles will when your majesty sends them here. Exiles um, was the sort of English translation that was used for Portuguese um, convicts who had the possibility of having part of their sentence commuted by uh, going out to uh, Portuguese colonies or possessions. And one of the things they would do then, of course, is uh, to learn the native language, go and live amongst the, uh, the natives, and then be used as translator informants uh, for the uh, Portuguese. What's interesting here is that the merits of the two uh, forms of translation, autonomous and heteronymous forms of translation or interpreting, uh, are being debated in this uh, situation. Of course, one of the things about return um, is that it rarely offers the uh, promise of uh, closure, the idea that when you return, that's it, you kind of close the circle. Um, what happens when um, Ulysses uh, gets back to Ithaca, uh, the first thing he does is he starts slaughtering people and the, the, the suitors of Penelope. If we look at one of the fables of return in the Bible, that of the prodigal son. The prodigal son is returning, but of course he's a very unsettling presence. Uh, uh, so what we find in uh, translation history, and interpreting history, is the dilemma with, for example, the autonomous form, you're sending your interpreters out, is that they will in fact go native, right? that they will switch uh, sides. Uh, you know, as an example, in the history of La, La Nouvelle France with uh, Etienne Brûlé, who uh, was sent out by the, uh, the French and who uh, went uh, native and was uh, involved in uh, military actions against the uh, French uh, colonial uh, power. So we find that again and again and again uh, in these translation and interpreting transactions, um, suspicions about the kind of tension between linguistic agility and political uh, fidelity. One of the most famous and oft-quoted scenes in Henry V is a scene where you get members of what will become the new parts, if you like, of the, uh, what will eventually become the United uh, Kingdom. Llewellyn McMorris and Gallen uh, Jamie, who uh, are having a discussion uh, amongst themselves. Llewellyn is the uh, Welshman. Uh, Captain McMorris, I think, look you, under your correction, there is not many of your nation. McMorris is the Irishman. Of my nation, what is my nation? Is a villain and a bastard and a knave and a rascal? What is my nation? Who talks of my nation? Fulan Miguel, the uh, Welshman, look you, if you take the matter otherwise than is meant, Captain McMorris, peradventure I shall think you do not use me, but that affability as in discretion you ought to use me, look you, being as good a man as yourself, both in the disciplines of wars and in the derivation of my birth and in other particularities. McMorris, I do not know you so good as myself, so Chris save me, I will cut off your head. Gowan, 
is the Englishman, the gentleman both, you will mistake each other, uh, Jamie the Scotsman, ah, uh, that's a foul fault. So what we're getting in this encounter is um, these four nations who are coming together to form this new uh, imperial uh, nation. But what you find in that moment of coming together is linguistic difference. It's marked phonetically in the case of MacMorris, but the Welsh, the Scots, and uh, Irish uh, languages uh, are complicating that moment of fusion. Because what are they doing? They're arguing. Uh, what does the, the gown the Englishman says? You will mistake each other. Right? And that's precisely, they're, they're speaking this language. We talked about this um, the other day in the case of Paul Theroux and the intralingual uh, traveling. They're speaking this common language. Um, but in that common language, there are all kinds of traces of translation that are complicating this moment of uh, communication. And it's in this um, context that I would just like to throw out um, a final um, idea, which is the relationship between translation and forgery and the notion of translation and the forging of the nation. Um, one of the functions that's often said uh, that translation uh, does is, in the words of René Lamiral, ça sert, ça ne dispense. Ça sert à uh, nous dispenser de la lecture du texte original. Um, we don't have to read the uh, original text because we can read it in translation. In other words, the idea is that you know, what translation uh, does in certain kind of you know, pragmatic defenses of translation is that it's as good as the original uh, thing. So you could argue, well, that's precisely what forgeries do, that's precisely what fakes do, that's precisely what counterfeits do, is they make you believe that you've got the, the real, the original uh, thing. Now, of course, the problem is that people can often feel very offended if translators are compared to forgers and fakes and counterfeiters and uh, described as, as, as crooks of one kind or the, the, the other. But I do think there's an interesting line of inquiry, which is that if we look at Tudor England, if we look at classical France, if we look at romantic Germany, if we look at nationalist uh, Ireland in the, in the 19th century, um, one of the things that translations are doing, because of this, this, this link to, to, to eloquence and power, is that they are forging the national language. They, they are being used, they're being brought in, if you like, to, to create, to strengthen, um, to make more comprehensive and operative uh, the uh, national uh, language. So does the forging, then, of a new national uh, identity imply uh, the forgery of translation? Uh, the reading of the translation as if it was the uh, original. Um, in other words, if we think back to the Henry V exchange there, are MacMorris and Flewellen and Jamie presenting themselves as original British uh, subjects? Uh, now, they're forging this new British identity uh, for themselves. Um, but at some level, that forging of a new identity is also a kind of forgery. In other words, it's uh, concealing the fact that the originals, in fact, are quite uh, different. Um, and if you think, for example, of the role of the uh, Ossianic, uh, the pseudo-translations by Macpherson, in feeding so many different cultural nationalist movements in Europe in the 19th century, uh, where you're talking about forging uh, an identity and the text itself is uh, a forgery, there's uh, an, an interesting uh, link between the, uh, the two. What about the very contemporary uh, situation? This is something that I want to explore more in our discussion. But I wanted to uh, finish off with 
a quotation from a book that appeared last year, uh, Melvin Bragg, who um, probably is a lot more sort of telegenic than myself, <laughs> um, who had a television series on the growth of the sort of the genesis, the growth, the expansion of the English language called the birth or the adventure of English. And he's talking about Shakespeare. And he says he is not only thought of it, but interesting of the originality of uh, Shakespeare, um, theoreticians and people who think about uh, translation, is autonomy, of vulnerability, of dependency, of heteronomy, um, that all those questions uh, are still right at the heart of translation speculation uh, today. But also, I think that Shakespeare suggests at that moment of uh, both ex expansion and integration um, something that um, Joyce in at the end of Portrait of the Artist um, expresses in a particular way. Stephen Dedalus has finally decided that he's had enough of what he calls the great center of paralysis, um, the city that I teach in. Um, and he's going to leave uh, Dublin, he's going to leave Ireland. And he's, he kind of sets out his, his, his famous manifesto. And he says, I go to encounter for the millionth time the reality of experience and forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race. And what I would argue is that that use of uh, forge there in Dedalus's statement is something that has uh, all kinds of interesting ramifications and resonances for the way in which we think of translation within uh, nations and uh, across nations. So that's what I'll uh, have to say for uh, this evening. So um, if there are questions or comments or, 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 or queries, I've probably tr trod on a, a lot of toes uh, in what I've been saying. But, uh,